It didn't do to ignore men. The majority of them were harmless, with nothing worse than a low capacity to irritate. They were worse than chiggers, but not as bad as bedbugs, in her view. Still, there was no doubt that there were some mean ones who plain had it in for women, and it was best to try and spot those and take precautions. But as for trusting the general run of men, there was no need, since she had no intention of ever expecting anything from one of them again. She didn't object to sitting in on a card game once in a while. She even enjoyed it, since making money at cards was considerably easier and more fun than doing it the other way. But a good game of cards once in a while was about as far as her expectations went. Immediately, Jake Spoon began to change the way her thinking worked. Before he even brought his bottle to the table to sit with her, she began to want him to. If he had taken the bottle and gone to sit by himself, she would have felt disappointed. But of course he didn't. He sat down, asked her if she'd like some refreshments, and looked her right in the face for a while in a friendly, easy-going way. My goodness, he said, I never expected to find nobody like you here. We didn't see much beauty when I lived in these parts. Now, if this was San Francisco, I wouldn't be so surprised. I reckon that's where you really belong. It seemed a miracle to Lori that a man had walked in who could figure that out so quick. In the last year, she had begun to doubt her own ability to get to San Francisco, and even to doubt that it was as cool and nice as she had been imagining it to be. And yet she didn't want to give up the notion, because she had no other notion to put in its place. It might be silly to even think about it, but it was the best she had. Then Jake came along and right away mentioned exactly the right place. Before the afternoon was over, she had laid aside her caution and her silence and told Jake more about herself than she had ever told anyone. Lippy and Xavier listened from a distance in astonished silence. Jake said very little, though he patted her hand from time to time and poured her a drink when her glass was empty. Once in a while he would say, My goodness, or that damned dog, I ought to go find him and shoot him but mostly he just looked friendly and confident, sitting there with his hat tipped back. When she got through with her story, he explained that he had killed a dentist in Fort Smith, Arkansas, and was a wanted man, but that he had hopes of eluding the law, and if he did, he would certainly try to see that she got to San Francisco, where she belonged. The way he said it made a big impression on Laurie. A sad tone came into his voice from time to time, as if it pained him to have to remember that mortality could prevent him from doing her such a favor. He sounded like he expected to die, and probably soon. It wasn't a whine, either, just a low note off his tongue and a look in his eye. It didn't interrupt for a minute his ability to enjoy the immediate pleasures of life. It gave Laurie the shivers when Jake talked like that, and made her feel that she wanted to play a part in keeping him alive. She was used to men thinking they needed her desperately just because they wanted to get their carrots in her, or wanted her to be their girl for a few days or weeks. But Jake wasn't asking for anything like that. He just let her see that he felt rather impermanent, and might not be able to carry out all that he wished. Lorena wanted to help him. She was surprised, but the feeling was too strong to deny. She didn't understand it, but she felt it. She knew she had a force inside her, but her practice had been to save it entirely for herself. Men were always hoping she would bestow some of it on them, but she never had. Then, with little hesitation, she began to offer it to Jake. He was a case. He didn't ask for help, but he knew how to welcome it. She was the one who suggested they go upstairs, mainly because she was tired of Lippy and Xavier listening to everything they said. On the way up, she noticed that Jake was favoring one foot, it turned out one of his ankles had been broken years before when a horse fell on him. The ankle was apt to swell if he had to ride hard for long stretches, as he had just done. She helped him ease his boot off and got him some hot water and Epsom salts. After he had soaked his foot for a while, he looked amused, as if he had just thought of something pleasant. You know, if there was a tub around here, I'd just have a bath and trim my mustache, he said. There was a wash tub sitting on the back porch. Lorena carried it up when she needed a bath, and the six or eight buckets of water it took to fill it. Xavier used it more often than she did. He could tolerate dirt on his customers, but not on himself. 
Lippy gave no thought to baths, so far as anyone knew. Lorena offered to go get the wash tub since Jake had one boot off, but he wouldn't hear of it. He took the other boot off and limped down by himself and got the tub. Then he bribed Lippy to heat up some water. It took a while since the water had to be heated on the cook stove. Why, Jake, you could buy a bath from the Mexican barber for ten cents, Lippy pointed out. That may be true, but I prefer the company in this establishment, Jake said. Lorena thought maybe he would want her to leave the room while he bathed, since so far he had treated her modestly. But he had nothing like that in mind. He latched her door so Lippy couldn't pop in and catch a glimpse of something it wasn't his business to see. Lippy will eye the girls, Jake said, no news to Lorena. I wished it was a bigger tub, he said. We could have us a wash together. Lorena had never heard of such a thing. It surprised her how coolly Jake stripped off for his wash. Like all men who weren't pure gamblers, he was burned brown on his face and neck and hands, and was fish white on the rest of his body. Most of her customers were brown down to their collar and white below. The great majority of them were reluctant to show anything of their bodies, though it was bodies they had come to satisfy. Some wouldn't even unbuckle their belts. Lorena often made them wait while she undressed. If she didn't, whatever she was wearing got mussed up. Also, she liked undressing in front of men because it scared them. A few would get so scared they had to back out of the whole business, though they always scrupulously paid her and apologized and made excuses. They came in thinking they wanted to persuade her out of her clothes, but when she matter-of-factly took them off, it often turned the tables. Gus was an exception, of course. He liked her naked, and he liked her clothed. Seeing one body would remind him of other bodies, and he would sit on the bed and scratch himself and talk about various aspects of women that only he would have had anything to say about, the varieties of bosoms, for example. Jake Spoon wasn't as talkative as Gus, but he was just as immodest. He sat happily in the tub until the water got cold. He even asked if she'd like to give him a haircut. She didn't mind trying, but quickly saw that she was making a mess of it and stopped with only a small portion of his curly black hair removed. Once he toweled himself off, he turned and led her to the bed. He stopped before he got there and looked as though he was going to offer her money. Lorena had wondered if he would, and when he stopped, she turned quickly so he could undo the long row of buttons down the back of her dress. She felt impatient, not for the act, but for Jake to go ahead and assume responsibility for her. She had never supposed that she would want such a thing from a man, but she was not bothered by the fact that she had changed her mind in the space of an hour, or that she was a little drunk when she changed it. She felt confident that Jake Spoon would get her out of Lonesome Dove, and she didn't intend to allow money to pass between them, or anything else that might cause him to leave without her. Jake immediately stepped over and helped her undo the buttons. It was plain she wasn't the first woman he had undressed, because he even knew how to unhook the dress at the neck, something most of her customers would never have thought of. You've had this one a while, I reckon, he said, looking rather critically at the dress once he got it off her. That too surprised her, for no man had ever commented, favorably or unfavorably, upon her clothes, not even Tinkersley, who had given her the money to buy the very dress Jake was holding, just a cheap cotton dress which was fraying at the collar. She had often meant to make a new dress or two, that being the only way to get one in Lonesome Dove, but she was awkward with a needle and was still getting by on the dresses she had bought in San Antonio. In the months there, she had had several offers to go to San Antonio with men who would probably have bought her dresses, but she had always declined. San Antonio was in the wrong direction. She hadn't liked any of the men, and anyway didn't really need new dresses since she was attracting more business than she wanted just wearing the old ones. Jake's comment had been mildly made, but it threw Lorena slightly off. She realized he was a finicky man. She could not get away with being lazy about herself any longer. A man who noticed a frayed collar with a near-naked woman standing right in front of him was a new kind of man to Lorena, one who would soon notice other things, some perhaps more serious than a collar. She felt disheartened. Some glow had seeped from the moment. Probably he had already been to San Francisco and seen finer women than her. Perhaps when it came time to leave he wouldn't want to bother with someone so ill-dressed. 
perhaps the surprise that had walked into her life would simply walk back out of it. But her sinking confidence was only momentary. Jake put the dress aside, watched her draw her shift off over her head, and sat beside her when she lay down. He was perfectly at ease. Well, Laurie, you take the prize, he said. I had not a hope of being this lucky when I headed back here. Why, you're as fine as flowers. When he began to stroke her, she noticed that his hands were like a woman's, his fingers small and his fingernails clean. Tinkersley had had clean fingernails, but Jake wasn't arrogant like Tinkersley, and he gave the impression of having nothing but time. Most men crawled on top of her at once, but Jake just sat on the bed smiling at her. When he smiled, her confidence returned. With most men, there was a moment when they moved their eyes away. But Jake kept looking at her right in the eye. He looked at her so long that she began to feel shy. She felt more naked than she had ever felt. And when he bent to kiss her, she flinched. She did not like kissing, but Jake merely grinned when she flinched, as if her shyness was funny. His breath was as clean as his hands. Many a sour breath had ruffled her hair and affronted her nostrils, but Jake's was neither rank nor sour. It had a clean, cedary flavor to it. When it was over, Jake took a nap, and instead of getting up and dressing, Lori lay with him, thinking. She thought of San Francisco, and just thinking about it made her think that she could do anything. She didn't even feel like moving to wipe the sheets. Let them be. She would be going soon, and Xavier could burn them for all she cared. When Jake woke, he looked at her and grinned, and his hand, warm now, went right back to work. If I ain't careful, I'm apt to sprout up again, he said. Lorena wanted to ask him why his breath smelled like cedar, but she didn't know if she ought, since he had just come to town. But then she asked him, a little shocked at hearing her own voice make the question. Why, well, I passed a cedar grove and cut myself some toothpicks, Jake said. There's nothing that sweetens the breath like a cedar toothpick unless it's mint, and mint don't grow in these parts. Then he kissed her again, as if to make her a present of his sweet breath. Between kisses, he talked to her about San Francisco, and what might be the best route to take. Even after he slid between her legs again, and made the old bed spring whine and the sorry mattress crackle, he kept talking a little. When he finally got up and stretched and suggested they go downstairs, Lorena felt more cheerful than she had for years. Xavier and Lippy, who were used to her long sulks, hardly knew what to think. Neither did Dish Boggett, who happened to walk in. Dish sat down and drank a bottle of whiskey before anybody noticed. Then he got to singing, and everybody laughed at him. Lorena laughed as loud as Lippy, whose lip waved like a flag when he was amused. Only later, when Jake left to ride south with Captain Call, did Lorena feel impatient. She wanted Jake to come back. The time with him had been so relaxed, it almost seemed like a wakeful dream of some kind. She wanted to have the dream again. That night, when a skinny cowboy named Jasper Fant came in from the river and approached her, Laurie just stared at him silently until he got embarrassed and backed off, never having actually said a word. Staring was all she had to do. Jasper consulted with Lippy and Xavier, and by the end of the week, all the cowboys along the river knew that the only sporting woman in Lonesome Dove had abruptly given up the sport. Chapter 14 When Jake finally came ambling up to the house, having spent the better part of the day asleep in Lorena's bed, Augustus was already nuzzling his jug from time to time. He was sitting on the front porch, waving off flies and watching the two Irishmen who were sleeping as if dead under the nearest wagon. They had gone to sleep in the wagon's meager shade. The shade had moved, but not the Irishman. The boy had no hat. He slept with his arm across his face. Jake didn't even glance at them as he walked past, a fact Augustus noted. Jake had never been renowned for his interest in people unless the people were whores. Where's Call? Jake asked when he got to the porch. You didn't expect to find Woodrow Call sitting in the shade, did you? Augustus asked. That man was born to work. Yes, and you was born to talk too much, Jake said. I need to borrow ten dollars. Oh, Augustus said. Has Laurie upped her rates? 
Jake ignored the question, which was only meant to rile him, and reached for the jug. No, the girl is as generous as a preacher's widow, Jake said. She wouldn't take money from a gentleman like me. I hope she charged you plenty, though, for I know you've been there before me. I've always tried to keep a step ahead of you, Jake, Augusta said. But to answer your question, Carl's gone to round up a dern bunch of cowboys so we can head out for Montana with a dern bunch of cows and suffer for the rest of our lives. Well, dern, Jake said. I admit I was a fool to mention it. He settled himself on the lower step and set the jug halfway between them so they could both reach it. He was mildly chagrined that Call had left before he could borrow the money. Extracting money from Augustus had always been a long and wearisome business. Call was easier when it came to money. He didn't like to lend it, but he would rather lend it than talk about it, whereas Augustus would rather talk than do anything. Also, it was bothersome that Call had seized on the idea of Montana so abruptly, though it had always been his view that if you could just hit Call with the right idea, he would apply his energies and make a fortune, which he might then share with the man who brought along the idea. Now that he was back, though, he wouldn't mind spending a few warm, idle months in Lonesome Dove. Lori was more of a beauty than he had expected to find. Her room over the saloon wasn't much, but it was better accommodation than they could expect on the way to Montana. As usual, though, life moved faster than he had intended it to. Call would come back with a lot of cowboys, and he would practically have to marry Lori in order to get out of going up the trail. Then if he did set his foot down and stay in Lonesome Dove, who knew but what some lawman from Fort Smith would show up and drag him off to hang. Just as he had been in the mood to slow down, his own loose mouth had gotten him in trouble. Maybe he won't find no cattle to drive, or no hands neither, he suggested, knowing it was wishful thinking. He'll find cattle, and if he can't find the hands, he'll drive him himself, Augusta said, and make us help him. Jake tipped his hat back and said nothing. The blue shote wandered around the corner of the house and stood there looking at him, which for some reason Jake found peculiarly irritating. Gus and his pigs were aggravating company. I ought to shoot that pig right betwixt the eyes, he said, feeling more irritable the longer he sat. There was not much good in anything that he could see. Either it was back to Montana and probably get scalped, or stay in Texas and probably get hung. And if he wasn't careful, the girl would get restless and actually expect him to take her to San Francisco. The main problem with women was that they were always wanting something like San Francisco, and once they began to expect it, they would get testy if it didn't happen. They didn't understand that he talked of pleasant things and faraway places just to create a happy prospect that they could look forward to for a while. It wasn't meant to really happen, and yet women never seemed to grasp that. He had been in ticklish spots several times as their disappointment turned to anger. It was something how mad women could get. Was you ever threatened by a woman, Gus, he asked, thinking about it. No, not what you'd call threatened, Augusta said. I was hit with a stove lid once or twice. Why, Jake asked. Why, no reason, Augusta said. If you live with Mexicans, you can expect to eat beans sooner or later. Who said anything about Mexicans, Jake said, a little exasperated. Gus was the derndest talker. Augustus chuckled. You was always slow to see the pint, Jake, he said. If you fool with women, you'll get hit by a stove lid sooner or later, whereas if you live with Mexicans, you have to expect beans in your diet. I'd like to see a woman that can hit me with a stove lid, Jake said. I will take an insult once in a while, but I'll be damned if I'd take that. Lori's apt to hit you with worse if you try to wiggle out of taking her to San Francisco, Augustus said, delighted that an opportunity had arisen to catch Jake out so early in his visit. Jake let that one float. Of course, Gus would know all about the girl. Not that it took brains to know about women. They spread their secrets around like honey in a fly trap. Of course, Lori would want to go to San Francisco, by common agreement, the prettiest town in the West. Augustus stood up and lifted his big pistol off the back of his chair. I guess we ought to wake up them Irishmen before they bake, he said. He walked over and kicked at their feet for a while until they began to stir. Finally, Alan O'Brien sat up looking groggy. Lord, it's warm, ain't it, he said. Why, this is spring, son, Augustus remarked. 
If you're looking for warm, come back on the 4th of July. We usually thaw out by then. When he was sure both Irishmen were awake, he went back to the house and came out with his rifle. Well, let's go, he said to Jake. Go where, Jake asked. I just got set down. To hide them horses, Augustus said. Pedro Flores is no quitter. He'll be coming. Jake felt sour. He wished again that circumstances hadn't prompted him to come back. He had already spent one full night on horseback, and now the boys were expecting him to spend another, all on account of a bunch of livestock he had no interest in in the first place. I don't know as I'm coming, he said. I just got here. If I'd known you boys did nothing but chouse horses around all night, I don't know that I would have come. Why, Jake, you lazy bean, Augustus said and walked off. Jake had a stubborn streak in him, and once it was activated, even Call could seldom do much with him. The Irish boy was standing up, trying to get the sleep out of his eyes. Come on, boys, Augustus said. Time to ride the river. You want us to ride some more, Sean asked. He had rolled over during his nap and had grass burrs in his shirt. You'll soon catch on to riding, Augustus said. It's easier than you might think. Do you have any mules? Sean asked. I'm better at riding mules. Son, we're fresh out, Augustus said. Can either of you boys shoot? No, but we can dig potatoes, Alan said. He didn't want the man to think they were totally incompetent. You boys took the wrong ship, Augustus said. I doubt there's ten spuds in this whole county. He caught them the gentlest horses out of the small bunch that were still penned, and taught them how to adjust their stirrups so their feet wouldn't dangle. He hadn't had time for that refinement in Sabinus. Just then Jake came walking along, a Winchester in the crook of his arm. No doubt he had concluded it would be easier to stay up all night than to explain to Call why he hadn't. Soon the Irishmen were mounted and were cautiously walking their mounts around the pen. It's new to them, but they're a quick-witted race, Augusta said. Give them a week and they'll be riding like Comanches. I don't know that I'll pause a week, Jake said. You boys have got hard to tolerate. I might take that yellow-haired girl and mosey off to California. Jake, you're a dern grasshopper, Augusta said. You ride in yesterday talking Montana, and today you're talking California. Once the Irishman had got fairly competent at mounting and dismounting, Augustus gave them each a Winchester and made them shoot at a cactus a time or two. You got to learn sometime, he said. If you can learn to ride and shoot before Captain Call gets back, he might hire you. The O'Brien boys were so awed to find themselves with deadly weapons in their hands that they immediately forgot to be nervous about their horses. Sean had never held a gun before, and the flat crack of the bullet when he shot at the cactus was frightening. It occurred to him that if they were expected to shoot, they could also expect to be shot at, an unappealing thought. Do we ask their names before we shoot them, he inquired. It ain't necessary, Augustus assured him. Most of them are named Jesus anyway. Well, I ain't named Jesus, Jake said. You boys try not to do your learning in my direction. I've been known to get riled when I'm shot at. When the two Irishmen came trotting up to the horse herd behind Augustus and Jake, Dish Boggett could hardly believe his eyes. He had always heard that the Hat Creek outfit was peculiar, but arming men who didn't even know how to dismount from their horses was not so much peculiar as insane. Augustus took the lead on a big white horse named Puddinfoot, and Jake Spoon followed him. Jake looked sour as clabber, which suited Dish fine. Maybe Lorena hadn't fallen quite in love with him after all. Dish rode over and poked Newt, who was asleep on his horse. Dish himself had napped from time to time, the day being hot and the horse herd placid. You ought to see what's coming, he said. Gus has put them dern midgets a horseback. Newt had a hard time getting his eyes open. As soon as the chase was over, sleep had begun trying to pull him down. If Pedro Flores had ridden up and offered to shoot him, he didn't think he would much care, since it would at least mean more sleep. He knew cowboys were supposed to be able to stay in the saddle two or three days at a stretch without sleep, but he was guiltily aware that he had not yet learned the trick. When Dish poked him, his hat fell off, and when he got down to get it, his legs felt as heavy as if somebody had put lead in his boots. He would have liked to say something to Sean O'Brien, who looked as tired as he was, but he couldn't think of a word to say. Augustus, who had had no chance to examine Call's big catch, rode into the herd, 
and eased through to the other side where Dietz and P were waiting. He took his time about it, giving the animals a critical inspection as he went past. Not more than forty of them struck him as prime mounts. A lot were undersized, some had saddle sores, and the whole bunch of them were skinny from overwork or underfeeding, or probably no feeding. Except for a prize stud or two, Pedro Flores had probably never wasted an oat on a horse in his life. These nags is barely worth a night's sleep, he said to Dietz and P. If we was aiming to start a soap factory, they might do, but so far as I know, we ain't. I've a notion to keep the best fifty and run the rest off. My lord, P said, aghast at what Gus had suggested. The captain would shoot all of us if we run off any of these horses. I don't doubt he'd foam at the mouth, Augusta said. What do you think, Dietz? They're skinny, Dietz said. Might get fat if we give them enough time. You might grow wings if I give you enough time, Augustus said. They looked across the river. The sun was slipping fast. In an hour or two, they could expect a loud visit. Here's the plan, he said. Pedro won't bother coming to town, knowing our habits like he does. We'll pen the prime stock and hide the skinny little rabbits up in some thicket. Then if we don't like the looks of his army, we can skedaddle and let him drive his own soap factory back home. P.I. felt deeply uneasy about the plan. When the captain was around, things were done in a more straightforward fashion. Gus was always coming up with something sly. However, P.'s opinion hadn't been asked. He watched as Gus and Dietz began to cut the herd. Soon, Dish Boggett figured out what was happening and rode over to help them. Dish was always a willing hand, except when it came to digging wells. Jake sat with the boy and the Irishman and watched the proceedings without much interest. He had himself a smoke, but didn't offer anybody else one. Newt watched, too, trying to decide if he ought to go help. Mr. Gus and Dietz and Dish were doing the work so efficiently he decided he'd just be in the way, so he stayed put, hoping Jake would say something to him. There had been no chance to renew their friendship since Jake had come home. As sunset approached, Newt felt more and more anxious. The captain being gone always affected him that way. He knew Mr. Gus was supposed to be one of the coolest hands on the border, and he was confident Jake could handle practically anything that came up. But despite those two, he couldn't stop himself from feeling anxious when the captain was gone. Young Sean O'Brien felt anxious, too, only his anxiety was of a different nature. The prospect of shooting and being shot at had loomed larger and larger in his thinking, until he could think of little else. Since Newt looked friendly, he decided to seek his counsel in the matter. What part of a man is it best to shoot at? he asked, addressing himself to Newt. Jake Spoon chuckled. His horse, he said. Just aim for his horse. There ain't many of them chilly bellies that will bother you once they're afoot. With that, he touched spurs to his horse and trotted around to the other side of the herd. Is that right? Sean asked. You're supposed to shoot the horse? If Jake says so, it's right, Newt said loyally, though the advice had surprised him, too. Have you shot many? Sean asked. Newt shook his head. Nope, he said. Last night was the first time I even got to go. I never even shot at a man or a horse either. You shoot the horse, Sean said when his brother Alan rode up. Alan said nothing. He was thinking of his little wife, Sari, whom he had left in Ireland. She had wept for weeks before he left, thinking it wrong that he should leave her. He had got his dander up and left anyway, and yet now he missed her so that tears as wet as hers sprang from his eyes almost every time he thought of her. Though normally a cheerful and even a merry man, the absence of Sari had affected him more than he had supposed anything could. In his mind's eye he saw her small, red-headed figure moving through the chores of the day, now cooking spuds, now wringing milk from the tired teat of their old milk cow. He ignored all talk when he was thinking of Sari, refusing to let it distract him. How would she feel if she could know what he had got himself into, sitting on a horse with a heavy gun beneath his leg. On the other side of the herd, Augustus had finished separating out the prime stock and was about to divide up the crew. Dietz and Dish were holding the cut at a little distance from the main herd. Well, girls, Augustus said, you might as well take these nags in and put them to bed. Me and this fine bunch of hands will ease the others upriver. 
Dish Margit could hardly believe his good fortune. He had been braced for a scratch night of brush-busting, but it seemed old Gus had a mind to spare him. All right, he said. Tell me what you want for supper, Gus, and I'll go eat it for you once we get these panned. Augustus ignored the sally. Deets, you watch close, he said. This young spark will probably have to go and get drunk, or maybe married, before the night is over. Dish waved and started the horses. Just as he did, Jake came loping over. Where are they going, he asked. Back to town, Augusta said. Be the safest place for the good stock, I figure. Why, damn, Jake said, plainly chagrined. You could have sent me back. I'm the one that's worn to a frazzle. Somebody's got to help me protect these boys, Augustus said. As I recall, you made a name for yourself by shooting Mexican bandits. I thought you'd welcome the chance to polish your reputation a little. I'd rather shoot you, Jake said, pretty grumpily. You've caused me more hell than all the bandits in Mexico. Now, Jake, be fair, Augustus said. You was just hoping to go back and get your bean in that girl again. I feel young Dish should have his shot before you ruin her completely. Jake snorted. The young cowboy was the least of his worries. If you like these Irishmen so much, you watch them, he said. Send me little Newt and we'll take one side. Are we supposed to be going anywhere in particular? No, Augustus said. Just try to keep them out of Mexico. He waved at Newt, who soon came loping over. Son, Jake Spoon has requested your help, he said. If you and him watch the east, me and P and them shortcakes will take the west. The boy's face lit up as if he had just been given a new saddle. He had practically worshipped Jake Spoon once, and would clearly be willing to again, given the encouragement. Augustus felt a momentary pang. He liked Jake, but felt him to be too leaky a vessel to hold so much hope. But then all vessels leaked to some degree. Will we just keep riding, or will we stop and wait for the Mexicans? Newt asked, anxious to know the right thing to do. Keep riding, Augustus said. Let them catch us, if they're men enough. And if they do, try not to shoot up all your ammunition. We might need some tomorrow. With that he turned, and in a few minutes, with the inexpert help of the Irishman, got the hundred horses moving north in the fading light. Chapter 15 The minute they got the herd penned, Dish felt himself getting restless. He had a smoke leaning on the gate of the big corral. He knew he had a clear duty to stay with the horses. Though the darky was obviously a superior hand, he could hardly be expected to hold the place against a swarm of bandits. The problem was that Dish could not believe in the swarm of bandits. Under the red afterglow, the town was still as a church. Now and then there was the bleat of a goat or the call of a bull bat, but that was all. It was so peaceful that Dish soon convinced himself there was no need for two men to waste the whole evening in a dusty corral. The bandits were theoretical, but Lorena was real and only two hundred yards away. Leaning on the gate, Dish had no trouble imagining favorable possibilities. Jake Spoon was only human, and he was oversure of himself at that. He might have rushed his suit. Dish could understand it. He would have rushed one himself had he known how. Perhaps Laurie had not welcomed such boldness. Perhaps she had recognized that Jake was not a man to depend on. By the time he had mulled the prospect for thirty minutes, Dish was in a fever. He had to have another shot or else carry some sharp regrets with him up the trail. Some might think it irresponsible. Captain Call, for one, certainly would but he could not stand all night in chunking distance of Lorena and not go see her. Well, it all looks safe, he said to Dietz, who had seated himself against a big water trough, his rifle across his lap. Quiet so far, Dietz agreed. I reckon it'll be some while before anything happens, if anything does, he said. I believe I'll just stroll over to that saloon and bathe my throat. Yes, sir, you go along, Dietz said. I can look after the stock. You just shoot if you need help, Dish said. I'll get back here in a minute if there's trouble. He took his horse so he wouldn't be caught afoot in the event of trouble and went trotting off. Dietz was just as glad to see him leave, for the young man's restlessness made him an uncomfortable companion. It was not a restlessness other men could talk to. Only a woman could cure it. 
Dietz had had such restlessness once, and had had no woman to cure it, but years and hard work had worn the edge off it, and he could relax and enjoy the quiet of the night if he was let alone. He liked sitting with his back against the water trough, listening to the horses settling themselves. From time to time one would come to the trough and drink, sucking the water into its mouth in long draughts. Across the pen two horses were stamping and snorting nervously, but Dietz didn't get up to go look. Probably it was just a snake that had snaked too close to the pen. A snake wasn't going to fool with horses if it could help it. The possibility of attack didn't worry him. Even if a few vaqueros did make a pass at the town, they would be nervous, sure of being outgunned. He could sleep. He had the knack of going in and out of sleep easily and quickly. But despite the long night and day, he wasn't sleepy. Relaxing, at times, was as good as sleeping. A sleeping man would miss the best of the evening and the moonrise as well. Dietz had always been partial to the moon, watched it often, thought about it much. To him it was a more interesting and a more affecting thing than the sun, which shone on every day in much the same fashion. But the moon changed. It moved around the sky. It waxed and waned. On the nights when it rose full and yellow over the plains around Lonesome Dove, it seemed so close that a man could almost ride over with a ladder and step right onto it. Dietz had even imagined doing it a few times, propping a ladder against the old full moon and stepping on. If he did it, one thing was sure. Mr. Gus would have something to talk about for a long time. Dietz had to grin at the mere thought of how excited Mr. Gus would get if he took off and rode the moon. For he thought of it like a ride, something he might just do for a night or two when things were slow. Then, when the moon came back close to Lonesome Dove, he would step off and walk back home. It would surprise them all. Other times, though, the moon rode so high that Dietz had to come to his senses and admit that no man could really ride on it. When he imagined himself up there on the thin little hook that hung above him white as a tooth, he almost got dizzy from his own imagining and had to try harder to pay attention to what was happening on the ground. Still, when there was nothing to see around him but a few horses sucking water, he could always rest himself by watching the moon and the sky. He loved clear nights and hated clouds. When it was cloudy, he felt deprived of half the world. His fear of Indians, which was deep, was tied to his sense that the moon had powers that neither white men nor black men understood. He had heard Mr. Gus talk about the moon moving the waters, and though he had glimpsed the ocean many times by the Matagorda, he had not been able to get a sense of how the moon moved it. But he was convinced that Indians understood the moon. He had never talked with an Indian about it, but he knew they had more names for it than white people had, and that suggested a deeper understanding. The Indians were less busy and would naturally have more time to study such things. It had always seemed to Dietz that it was lucky for the whites that the Indians had never gained full control over the moon. He had dreamed once, after the terrible battle of Fort Phantom Hill, that the Indians had managed to move the moon over by one of those little low hills that were all over West Texas. They had got it to pause by the edge of a mountain so they could leap their horses onto it. It still occurred to him at times that such a thing might have happened, and that there were Comanches, or possibly Kiowa, riding around on the moon. Often, when the moon was full and yellow and close to the earth, he got the strong feeling that Indians were on it. It was a fearful feeling, one he had never discussed with any man. The Indians hated the whites, and if they got control of the moon which was said to control the waters, then terrible things might happen. The Indians could have the moon suck all the water out of the wells and rivers, or else turn it all to salt like the ocean. That would be the end, and a hard end at that. But when the moon was just a little white hook, Dietz tended to lose his worries. After all, water was still sweet, except for an alkaline river or two, like the Pecos. Perhaps if the Indians got on the moon they had all fallen off. Sometimes Dietz wished that he could have had some schooling, so as to learn maybe the answers to some of the things that puzzled and intrigued him. Night and day itself was something to ponder. 
There had to be a reason for the sun to fall, lie hidden, and then rise again from the opposite side of the plain, and other reasons for the rain, the thunder, and the slicing north wind. He knew the big motions of nature weren't accidents. It was just that his life had not given him enough information to grasp the way of things. And yet Indians, who could not even talk a normal language, seemed to understand more about it even than Mr. Gus, who could talk a passel about the motions of nature or anything else you wanted to hear talked about. Mr. Gus had even tried to tell him the world was round, though Dietz regarded that as just joking talk. But it was Mr. Gus who put his name on the sign so that everybody who could read would realize he was part of the outfit. It made up for a lot of joking. Dietz rested happily by the water trough, now and then glancing at the full moon. The ground shadows hid him completely, and any vaquero foolish enough to try and slip in would get a sharp surprise. Dish himself got something of a surprise when he walked into the dry bean, for Lorena was not alone, as he had been imagining her to be. She sat at a table with Xavier and Jasper Fant, the skinny little wadi from upriver. Dish had met Jasper once or twice and rather liked him, though at this time he would have liked him a lot better if he had stayed upriver where he belonged. Jasper had a sickly look to him, but in fact was as healthy as the next man and had an appetite to rival Gus McRae's. There's Dish, Lorena said when he came in the door. Now we can have a game. Lippy, as usual, was kibitzing, putting in his two cents worth, whether they were wanted or not. Not unless he's been to the bank we can't, he said. Xavier cleaned Dish out last night, and he ain't active enough to make his fortune back in one day. Don't mean he can't take a hand, Jasper said, giving Dish a friendly nod. Xavier's cleaned me out, too, and I'm still playing. We all got weaknesses, Lippy observed. Vance's is playing poker for credit. That's why he can't afford to pay his piano player an honest wage. Xavier endured these witticisms silently. He was in a worse mood than usual, and he knew why. Jake Spoon had come to town and promptly deprived him of a whore, an asset vital to an establishment such as his in an out-of-the-way place like Lonesome Dove. Many a traveler who might not ordinarily come that far would because of Lori. There was no woman like her on the border. She was not friendly, but because of her, men came and stayed to drink away the night. He would not be likely to get another such whore. There were Mexican women as pretty, but few cowboys would ride the extra miles for a Mexican woman, those being plentiful in most parts of South Texas. Besides, he himself bought Lori once a week, if not more. Once, in a period of restless enthusiasm, he had bought her six times in five days, after which, being ashamed of his extravagance, if not his lust, he abstained for two weeks. It was a happy convenience having Laurie in the place, and a fine change from his wife, Therese, who had been stingy with her favors and a bully to boot. Once Therese had denied him anything resembling a favor for a period of four months, which for a man of Xavier's temperament was a painful thing, he had been required to hunt Mexican women himself during that period, and had come close to feeling the wrath of a couple of Mexican husbands. By contrast, Lori was restful, and he had come to love her. She did not exhibit the slightest fondness for him, but neither did she raise the slightest objection when he felt like buying her, a fact Lippy was deeply resentful of. She refused to be bought by Lippy at any price. Now Jake Spoon had spoiled it all, and the only way Xavier could vent his annoyance was by winning money from Jasper Fant, most of which he would never collect. Where's Jake? Laurie asked, a shock to Dish. His hopes, which had been soaring as he walked through the dark to the saloon, flopped down to boot level. For her to inquire about the man so shamelessly bespoke a depth of attachment that Dish could barely imagine. It was not likely she would ever inquire at all about him, even if he stepped out the door and vanished for a year. Why, Jake's with Gus and the boys, he said, sitting down to make the best face of it he could. It was not much of a face, for Lori had never seemed prettier to him. She had pushed up the sleeves of her dress, and when it came her turn to handle the cards, her white arms all but mesmerized him. He could hardly think to bet for watching Lori's arms and her firm lips, 
Her arms were plumpish, but more graceful than any dish had ever seen. He could not think what he was doing. He wanted her so much. It caused him to play so badly that in an hour he had lost three months' wages. Jasper Fant fared no better, whether from love of Laurie or lack of skill, Dish didn't know, didn't know and didn't care. All he was conscious of was that somehow he would have to outlast Jake, for there could be no woman for him except the one across the table. The very friendliness with which she treated him stung like a scorpion bite, for there was nothing special in it. She was almost as friendly to Lippy, a pure fool, and with a hole in his stomach to boot. The card game soon became a torture for everyone but Laurie, who won hand after hand. It pleased her to think how surprised Jake would be when he came back and saw her winnings. He would know she wasn't helpless, at least. Xavier himself didn't lose much, he never lost much, but he wasn't playing with his usual alertness. Laurie knew that might be because of her, but she didn't care. She had always liked playing cards, and liked it even better now that it was all she had to do until Jake came back. She even liked Dish and Jasper a little. It was a relief not to have to hold herself out of the fun because of what they wanted. She knew they felt hopeless, but then she had felt hopeless enough times, waiting for them to work up their nerve or else borrow two dollars. Let them get a taste. Dish, we might as well stop, Jasper said. We'll barely get out of debt this year as it is. I'll take a hand, Lippy said. I might be rusty, but I'm willing. Let him play, Xavier said suddenly. It was a house rule that Lippy was not allowed to gamble. His style was extravagant and his resources meager. Several times his life had been endangered when strangers discovered he had no means of paying them the sums he had just lost. But Xavier had lost faith in house rules, since it had also been a house rule that Lorena was a whore, and now she wasn't any more. If a whore could retire so abruptly, Lippy might as well play cards. What's he going to pay me with when I win? Lorena asked. Sweet music, Lippy said cheerfully. I'll play your favorite song. It was not much enticement, Lorena thought, since he played her favorite songs every time she came in the room as it was, hoping his skill at the keyboard would finally move her to let him buy a poke. She wasn't about to start that, but she did play him a few hands. The cowboys were too sunk even to drink. The boys said goodnight to her politely, hoping she would think kindly of them, but she didn't. Boys didn't interest her as much as cards. Outside, Jasper paused in the street and had a smoke with Dish. Hired on yet? Jasper asked. He had a mustache no thicker than a shoestring, and a horse that was not much thicker than the mustache. I think so, Dish said. I'm working for these Hat Creek boys right now. They're thinking of getting up a drive. You mean they hire you to play cards? Jasper asked. He fancied himself a joker. Oh, I was just resting, Dish said. I'm helping their darky guard some stock. Guard it from what? From the Mexicans we stole it from, Dish said. The captain went off to hire a crew. Hell, Jasper said, if the Mexicans knew the captain was gone, they'd come and take back Texas. I reckon not, Dish said. He felt the remark was slightly insulting. The captain was not the only man in Texas who could fight. He can hire me if he wants to when he gets back, Jasper said. He probably will, Dish said. Jasper had a reputation for being reliable, if not brilliant. Though aware that Dish might be touchy on the subject, Jasper was curious about what had happened to change Laurie so. He looked wistfully at the light in her window. Is that girl got married or what? he asked. Every time I jingled my money, she looked at me like she was ready to carve my liver. Dish resented the question. He was not so coarse as to enjoy discussing Laurie with just any man who happened to ask. On the other hand, it was hard to see Jasper Fant as a rival. He looked half-starved, and probably was. It's a scoundrel named Jake Spoon, Dish said. I reckon he's beguiled her. Oh, so that's it, Jasper said. I believe I've heard the name. A pistolero of some kind, ain't he? I wouldn't know what he is, Jake said, in a tone that was meant to let Jasper know he had no great interest in discussing the matter further. Jasper took the hint, and the two of them rode over to the Hat Creek pens in silence, their minds on the white-armed woman in the saloon. 
She was no longer unfriendly, but it seemed to both of them that things had gone a little better before the change. Chapter 16 By the end of the first day's hiring, Call had collected four boys, none of them yet eighteen. Young Bill Spettle, the one they called Swift Bill, was no older than Newt, and his brother Pete only a year older than Bill. So desperate were their family circumstances that Call was almost hesitant to take them. The widow Spettle had a brood of eight children, Bill and Pete being the oldest. Ned Spettle, the father of them all, had died of drink two years before. It looked to Call as if the family was about to starve out. They had a little creek-bottom farm not far north of Pickles Gap, but the soil was poor, and the family had little to eat but sow belly and beans. The widow Spettle, however, was eager for him to take the boys, and would hear no protest from Call. She was a thin woman with bitter eyes. Call had heard from someone that she had been raised rich in the East, with servants to comb her hair and help her into her shoes when she got up. It might just have been a story. It was hard for him to imagine a grown-up who would need to be helped into their own shoes. But if even part of it was true, she had come a long way down. Ned Spettle had never got around to putting a floor in the shack of a house he built. His wife was rearing eight children on the bare dirt. He had heard it said that Ned had never got over the war, which might have explained it. Plenty hadn't. It accounted for the shortage of grown men of a certain age, that war. Call himself felt a kind of guilt at having missed it, though the work he and Gus had done on the border had been just as dangerous and just as necessary. Take em, the widow Spettle said, looking at her boys as if she wondered why she'd borne them. I reckon they'll work as hard as any. Call knew the boys had helped take a small herd to Arkansas. He paid the widow a month's wage for each boy, knowing she would need it. There was evidently not a shoe in the family. Even the mother was barefoot, a fact that must shame her if the servant's story were true. He didn't take the Spettle boys with him, for he had brought no spare horses. But the boys started at once for Lonesome Dove on foot, each of them carrying a blanket. They had one pistol between them, a navy colt with half its hammer knocked off. Though Call assured them he would equip them well once they got to Lonesome Dove, they wouldn't leave the gun. We've never shot every other gun, Swift Bill said, as if that meant they couldn't. When he took his leave, Mrs. Spettle and the six remaining children scarcely noticed him. They stood in the hot yard with a scrawny hen or two, scratching around their bare feet, watching the boys and crying. The mother, who had scarcely touched her sons before they left, stood straight up and cried. Three of the children were girls, but the other three were boys in their early teens, old enough at least to be of use to their mother. We'll take good care of them, Call said, wasting words. The young girls hung on to the widow's frayed skirts and cried. Call rode on, though with a bad feeling in his throat. It was better that the boys go. There was not enough work for them there. And yet they were the pride of the family. He would take as good care of them as he could, and yet what did that mean, with a drive of 2,500 miles to make? He made the rainy ranch by sundown, a far more cheerful place than the Spettel homestead. Joe Rainey had a twisted leg, the result of an accident with a buckboard, but he got around on the leg almost as fast as a healthy man. Call was not as fond of Maud, Joe's fat red-faced wife as Augustus was, but then he had to admit he was not as fond of any woman as Augustus was. Maud Rainey was built like a barrel, with a bosom as big as buckets and a voice that some claimed would make hair fall out. It was the general consensus around Lonesome Dove that if she and Augustus had married, their combined voices would have deafened whatever children they might have produced. She talked at table like some men talked when they were driving mules. Still, she and Joe had managed to produce an even dozen children so far, eight of them boys and all of them strapping. Among them, the Rainies probably ate as much food in one meal as the Spettles consumed in a week. As near as Call could determine, they all devoted most of their waking hours to either growing or butchering or catching what they ate. Augustus's blue pigs had been purchased from the Rainies, and were the first thing Maud thought to inquire about when Call rode up. "'Have you et that shoat yet?' Maud asked before he could even dismount. "'No, we ain't,' Call said. "'I guess Gus is saving him for Christmas, or else he just likes to talk to him.' "'Well, step down and have a wash at the bucket,' Maud said.' 
I'm cooking one of that Schultz cousins right this minute. It had to be admitted that Maud Rainey set a fine table. Call had no sooner got his sleeves rolled up and his hands clean than supper began. Joe Rainey just had time to mumble a prayer before Maud started pushing around the cornbread. Call was faced with more meats than he had seen on one table since he could remember. Beefsteak and pork chops, chicken and venison, and a stew that appeared to contain squirrel and various less familiar meats. Maud got red in the face when she ate, as did everyone else at her table, from the steam rising off the platters. This is my varmint stew, Captain, Maud said. Oh, he asked politely, what kind of varmints? Whatever the dogs catch, Maud said, or the dogs themselves if they don't manage to catch nothing. I won't support a lazy dog. She put a possum in, one of the little girls said. She seemed as full of mischief as her fat mother, who, fat or not, had made plenty of mischief among the men of the area before she settled on Joe. Now, Maggie, don't be giving away my recipes, Maud said. Anyway, the captain's likely at possum before. At least it ain't a goat, Call said, trying to make conversation. It was an unfamiliar labor, since at his own table he mostly worked at avoiding it. But he knew women liked to talk to their guests, and he tried to fit into the custom. We've heard a rumor that Jake is backing on the run, Joe Rainey said. He wore a full beard, which at the moment was shiny with pork drippings. Joe had a habit of staring straight ahead. Though Call assumed he had a neck joint like other men, he had never seen him use it. If you happened to be directly in front of him, Joe would look you in the eye. But if you were positioned a little to the side, his look went floating on by. Yes, Jake arrived, Call said. He's been to Montana and says it's the prettiest country in the world. It's probably filled with women then, Maud said. I remember Jake. If he can't find a woman, he gets so restless he'll scratch. Call saw no need to comment on Jake's criminal status, if any. Fortunately, the Rainies were too busy eating to be very curious. The children, who had been well brought up, didn't try for the better meats, but made do with a platter of chicken and some fryback and cornbread. One little tad, evidently the runt of the family, got nothing but cornbread and chicken gizzards, but he knew better than to complain. With eleven brothers and sisters all bigger than him, complaint would have been dangerous. Well, what's Gus up to? Maud asked. I've been sitting here waiting for him to come over and try to take me away from Joe, but I don't guess he's coming. Has he still got his craving for buttermilk? Yes, he drinks it by the gallon, Carl said. I fancy it myself, so we compete. He felt Maud's statement not in the best of taste, but Joe Rainey continued to stare straight ahead and drip into his beard. Call finally asked if he could hire a couple of the boys. Maud sighed and looked down her double row of children. I'd rather sell pigs than hire out boys, she said, but I guess they've got to go see the world sometime. What's the pay? Joe asked, always the practical man. Why, forty dollars and found, I reckon, Call said. Of course we'll furnish the mounts. That night he slept in a wagon in the Rainey's yard. He had been offered a place in the loft, but it was piled so high with children that he hardly trusted himself in it. Anyway, he preferred the out-of-doors, though the out-of-doors at the Rainey's was more noisy than he was used to. The pigs grunted all night, looking for lizards or something to eat. Then there was a barn owl that wouldn't stop calling, so he had a time getting to sleep. The next morning he got a promise from Maud that her two oldest boys would get themselves to Lonesome Dove by the end of the week. The boys themselves, Jimmy and Ben Rainey, scarcely said a word. Call rode off feeling satisfied, believing he had enough of a crew to start gathering cattle. Word would get out and a few more men would probably trickle in. They had to get the cattle and get them branded. At least they had the luxury of surplus horses, or did if Gus and Jake hadn't contrived to fiddle around and lose them. He worried about that possibility most of the way home. Not that Gus wasn't competent, so far as sheer ability went. Gus was as competent as any man he'd ever known. There had been plenty of times when he'd wondered if he himself could match Gus, if Gus really tried. It was a question that never got tested, because Gus seldom tried. As a team, the two of them were perfectly balanced. He did more than he needed to, while Gus did less. Gus himself often joked about it. If you got killed, I might work harder, he said. I might get in a righteous frame of mind if I had that stimulation. But you ain't killed, so what's the point? 
Call wasted no time getting back, wishing all the way that he had the mare. She had spoiled him, made him too aware of the limitations of his other mounts. The fact that she was dangerous made him like her the more. She made him extra watchful, which was good. When he got within fifteen miles of Lonesome Dove, he cut west, thinking they would be holding the herd in that direction. He rode along the southern edge of the bad brush country and struck the trail of the horses. They had been going back south over their own tracks, which was curious. Gus had taken them back to town. Probably he had a reason, but it was not one Call could guess, so he loped on home. When he approached the town, he saw the horses grazing upriver a little ways, with Dietz and Newt and the Irishman holding them. They looked to be all there, so evidently nothing had happened. One thing about Gus McCrae, he was easily found. By three in the afternoon, any afternoon, he would be sitting on the porch, drawing occasionally from his jug. When Call rode up, he was sitting there taking a nap. There was no sign of Jake. You're a fine guard, he said, dismounting. Augustus had his hat over his eyes, but he removed it and looked at Call. How's Maud Rainey? he asked. She's in good health, Call said. She fed me twice. Good thing it was just twice, Augustus said. If you'd stayed a week, you'd have had to rent an ox to get home on. She's anxious to sell you some more pigs, Call said, taking the jug and rinsing his mouth with whiskey. If Joe was to get killed, I might court her again, Augustus speculated. I hope you will, Call said. Them twelve young'uns ought to have a good father. What are the horses doing back here so soon? Why, grazing, most likely, Augustus said. Didn't Pedro make a try? No, he didn't, and for a very good reason, Augustus said. What reason would that be? Because he died, Augustus said. Well, I swear, Call said, stunned. Is that the truth? Well, I ain't seen the corpse, Augustus said, but I imagine it's true. Jasper Fant rode in looking for work and had the news, though the scamp didn't give it to me until I had wasted most of the night. I wonder what killed him, Call said. Pedro Flores had been a factor in their lives off and on for thirty years, though probably they had not actually seen him more than six or seven times. It was surprising, hearing he was gone, and though it should have been a relief, it wasn't exactly. It was too much of a surprise. Jasper wasn't up on the details, Augustus said. He just heard it from a vaquero. But I allow it's true, because it explains why you could lope in with a boy and an idiot and saunter off with his remuda. Well, I swear, Call said again. I never expected that. Oh, well, Augustus said, I never either. But then I don't know why not. Mexicans don't have no special dispensation. They die like the rest of us. I expect Ball will die one of these days, and then we won't have nobody to whack the dinner bell with the crowbar. Pedro was tough, though, Call said. After all, the man had more or less held nearly a hundred-mile stretch of the border, and for nearly thirty years. Call had known many men who died, but somehow had not expected it of Pedro, though he himself had fired several bullets at him. I'd sure like to know what took him, Call said. He might have choked on a pepper, Augustus said. Them that can't be killed by knives or bullets usually break their necks falling off the porch or something. Remember Johnny Norvell dying of that bee sting? I guess Johnny had been shot twenty times, but a darn bee killed him. It was true. The man had rangered with them, and yet the bee sting had given him a seizure of some kind, and no one could bring him out of it. Well, it will about finish the Flores operation, Augustus said. He just had three boys, and we hung the only one of them with any get-up-and-go. To Augustus's surprise, Call sat down on the porch and took a big swallow from the jug. He felt curious, not sick, but suddenly empty. It was the way a kick in the stomach could make you feel. It was an odd thing, but true, that the death of an enemy could affect you as much almost as the death of a friend. He had experienced it before, when news reached them that Kicking Wolf was dead. Some young soldier on his second patrol had made a lucky shot and killed him on the clear fork of the Brazos, and Kicking Wolf had kept two companies of rangers busy for twenty years, killed by a private. Call had been shoeing a horse when P. brought him that piece of news, and he felt so empty for a spell that he had to put off finishing the job. That had been ten years ago, and he and Gus soon quit rangering. So far as Call was concerned, the death of Kicking Wolf meant the end of the Comanches, and thus the end of their real job. There were other chiefs, true, and the final fights were yet to be fought. 
but he had never had the vengeful nature of some rangers, and had no interest in spending a decade mopping up renegades and stragglers. Pedro Flores was a far cry from being the fighter-kicking wolf had been. Pedro seldom rode without twenty or thirty vaqueros to back him up, whereas Kicking Wolf, a small man, no bigger than the boy, would raid San Antonio with five or six braves and manage to carry off three women and scare all the whites out of seven or eight counties just by traveling through them. But Pedro was of the same time and had occupied them just as long. I didn't know you liked that old bandit so much, Augusta said. I didn't like him, Call said. I just didn't expect him to die. He probably never expected it neither, Augusta said. He was a rough old cob. After a few minutes, the empty feeling passed, but Call didn't get to his feet. The sense that he needed to hurry, which had been with him most of his life, had disappeared for a space. We might as well go to Montana, he said. The fun's over around here. Augustus snorted, amused by the way his friend's mind worked. Call, there never was no fun around here, he said. And besides, you never had no fun in your life. You wasn't made for fun. That's my department. I used the wrong word, I guess, Call said. Yes, but why did you, Augustus said. That's the interesting part. Call didn't feel like getting drawn into an argument, so he kept quiet. First you run out of Indians. Now you've run out of bandits. That's the point, Augustus said. You've got to have somebody to outwit, don't you? I don't know why I'd need anybody when I've got you, Call said. I don't see why we just don't take over northern Mexico now that Pedro's dead, Augustus said. It's just down the darn street. I'm sure there's still a few folks down there who'd give you a fight. I don't need a fight, Call said. It won't hurt us to make some money. It might, Augusta said. I might drown in the Republican River like the Pumphrey boy. Then you'd get all the money. You wouldn't even know how to have fun with it. You'd probably use it to buy gravestones for old bandits you happened to like. If you drown in the Republican River, I'll give your part to Jake, Call said. I guess he'd know how to spend it. With that, he mounted and rode off, meaning to find Jasper Fant and hire him if he really wanted to work. Chapter 17 By the time Jake Spoon had been in Lonesome Dove ten days, Lorena knew she had a job to do, namely the job of holding him to his word and making sure he took her to San Francisco as he had promised to do. Of course, Jake had not given her any direct notice that he intended to do differently. He moved in with her immediately and was just as pleasant about everything as he had been the first day. He had not taken a cent of money from her, and they seldom passed an hour together without him complimenting her in some way, usually on her voice or her looks or the fine texture of her hair or some delicacy of manner. He had a way of appearing always mildly surprised by her graces, and if anything, his sentiments only grew warmer as they got to know one another better. He repeated several times his dismay at her having been stuck for so long in a dismal hole like Lonesome Dove. But after a week, Lorena became aware of a curious thing. Jake was more attached to her than she was to him. The fact struck her late one afternoon while she was watching him nap. He had insisted on a route and gone right to sleep afterward. While the sweat was cooling on them, she realized she wasn't excited about him in the way she had been the first day. The first day had been one of the big days of her life, because of the smooth way Jake had shown up and taken over, ending her long period of tension and discomfort. She felt peaceful with him. They had never quarreled, and he had not demonstrated the slightest inclination to meanness. But it was clear to her already that he was one of those men somebody had to take care of, he had fooled her for a few days into thinking he would do the taking care of, but that wasn't so. He was a clever card player and could make money, but that was just part of it. Jake had to have company. When he slept or when he was amused or was just lolling around telling stories, the childish part of him showed, and it was a big part. Before the week was over, it seemed to her that he was all play. The realization didn't disturb her calm, though. It meant he needed her more than he would admit. She recognized the need and didn't care whether he admitted it or not. If Jake had been as firm as he pretended to be, 
It would have left her with little security. He could have just walked off, but he wouldn't. He liked talk, woman's talk, and the comforts of the bed. He even liked it that she lived alone above the saloon, since it meant a game was handy if he felt like playing. Since the Hat Creek outfit had been gathering cattle and getting ready for their drive, games were handier than they had been for a while. Several cowboys drifted into Lonesome Dove looking for work. Some of them had enough snap left at night to wander in and cut the cards. A tall cowboy named Needle Nelson showed up from north of San Antonio, and a cheerful cowboy from Brownsville named Bert Borum. At first, Xavier was cheered by all the new customers until it occurred to him that they would only be there for a week or two. Then the thought of how empty the saloon would soon be filled him with gloom, and he stood by the door most of the night, his wash rag dripping down his leg. Lippy was kept plenty busy, for the cowboys were always requesting songs. Lippy liked the company. He was proud of his talent at the keyboard and would pound out any song that was requested. Jake took pains to teach Lorena a few things about card playing that she didn't know. She came to wonder how Jasper and Bert and Needle Nelson got by on so little sleep, for the captain worked them hard all day, and the games went on half the night. The only cowboy likely to pull a sour face if she sat in was Dish Boggett, who wouldn't get over being in love with her. It amused her that he sat there looking so solemn with his big mustache, Jake did not even seem to notice that the man was in love with her. She was tempted to tease Jake a little, but he had told her plain out he was a jealous man. For all she knew, he might shoot Dish, which would be a pity. Dish was nice enough, it was just that he couldn't compare with Jake Spoon. When the gathering and branding of cattle had been going on for about ten days, Lorena began to feel a crisis coming. She heard the boys speculate that the branding would be done in another week, which meant they were close to starting the drive. The boys were saying they were already late. Hell, we'll be crossing the Yellowstone on the darn ice if we don't get started, Needle Nelson said. He was a funny-looking man, thin as a wire, and with an Adam's apple that looked as big as a turkey egg. Why, I doubt we'll make the Yellowstone, Jasper Fant said. Most of us will get drowned before we get that far. Needle won't, Dish Boggett suggested. There ain't a river up that way deep enough he couldn't walk through it and not get his hat wet. I can swim anyway, Needle remarked. I'd like to see you swim with fifty or sixty cattle on top of you, or maybe your own horse, Jasper said. Ain't no fifty or sixty cattle going to be on top of me, Needle replied, unruffled. Nor no dern horse neither. Bert Borum thought Needle was hilarious. He thought pretty near everything was hilarious. He was one of those men who have a laugh you like to hear. I'm getting me a float before I cross Area River, he declared. What kind of float, Dish inquired. Ain't decided, Bert said. Might tie a few jugs to my horse. Jugs are good floats. Where would you get a dern jug on a cattle drive, Jasper asked. If the captain was to catch you with a jug, he'd want to know who drank the whiskey out of it. Jake was tolerant of the cowboys, but careful to keep himself a bit apart from them. He never chimed in when they talked about the life they would have on the trail, and he never spoke to Lorena about the fact that the herd would be leaving in ten days. He didn't work much on the branding, either, though once in a while he spent a night helping them gather more stock. Mostly, he let it appear that the drive had nothing to do with him. Lorena didn't press him, but she kept an eye on him. If he wanted to stay, that was one thing, but if he planned on going, he was going to have to figure a way to take her. He wasn't leaving without her, whatever he might think about the matter. Then, before the issue came to a head, something happened that took Lorena completely unaware. It was a blistering day, the saloon totally empty except for Lippy. Xavier, who had a taste for fish, had gone off to the river to see if he could catch any. Lorena was sitting at a table practicing one or two card tricks Jake had taught her, when who should walk in but Gus. His shirt was as wet from sweat as if he'd been under water a week, and even his hat band was sweated through. He went around behind the bar, got himself a bottle, and brought it over to the table, grinning a big grin despite the heat. She noted that he brought her a glass, which struck her as bold, but then Gus would do anything, as Jake was always saying. What I can't figure out is why there ain't but two sinners in this saloon. 
Gus said. Lorena made no comment, but Lippy piped up. I've tried to sin all my life. Ain't you going to count me? he asked. No, you got a hole in your stomach, Augusta said. You paid for yours, but so far me and Laurie have got off scot-free. Gus poured a little whiskey in her glass and filled his to just below the brim. I want a poke, he said, as casual as if he were asking her to loan him two bits. Lorena was so taken aback that she didn't know what to say. She looked at Lippy, who was just sitting there listening as if it were his right. Gus, of course, was not the slightest bit embarrassed by what he was suggesting. He took his hat off and hung it on a chair, looking at her pleasantly. Lorena felt sorely at a loss. She had never expected Gus to commit such a blunder, for it was well known that he and Jake were good friends. Gus must know that Jake was living with her, and yet he walked in and asked, as if it made no difference. She sat silent, showing her puzzlement, which only seemed to amuse Gus. I wished you wouldn't sit there thinking about it, he said. Just sell me the poke and be done with it. I hate to sit and watch a woman think. Why? she asked, finding her voice again. She felt the beginnings of indignation. I guess I got the right to think if I want to, she added. Gus just grinned. Oh, you got the right, he said. It's just that it's fearsome for a man to have a woman start thinking right in front of him. It always leads to trouble. He paused and drank a healthy swallow of whiskey. I'm with Jake now, Lorena said, merely stating the obvious. I know that, honey, Augustus said. The minute I looked up the road and seen Jake coming, I knew you and him would settle in. Jake's a good hand to settle in with, I admit. A sight better than me. But the fact is, he went out to the cow camp at the wrong time, and Call put him to work. Call don't appreciate Jake's restful qualities like you and me do. He's been fretting for a week because Jake wasn't working. And now that he's got him, you can bet he'll keep him a day or two. Lorena looked at Lippy, wishing he wasn't there. But Lippy sat astonished at what he was hearing. His lip hung down like a flap of some kind, as it always did when he forgot himself. Jake ain't got the stuff to stand up to call, Augustus said. He's going to have to stay out there and brand doggies for a while. So there ain't no reason for you not to sell me a poke. I told you the reason, Lorena said. Jake takes care of me now, she added. No, he don't, Gus said. You take care of him. It was the very truth Lorena had discovered for herself, and it stumped her that Gus would not only know it, but come right out with it as if it were an ordinary fact. Jake Spoon has never taken care of nobody, Gus said, not even himself. He's the world's child, and the main point about him is that he'll always find somebody to take care of him. It used to be me and Call, but right now it's you. That's fine and good, but it's no reason you should go out of business entirely. You can sell me a poke and still take care of Jake. Lorena knew that was true as far as it went. Jake was not hard to take care of and probably not hard to fool. It wouldn't enter his head that she would sell a poke now that she had him. He had plenty of pride and not a little vanity. It was one of the things she liked about him. Jake thought well of his looks. He was not a dressy man like Tinkersley, but he nonetheless took pains with his appearance and knew that women fancied him. She had never seen him mad, but she knew he would not like anyone to make light of him. I believe he'd shoot the man that touches me, she said. I believe it too, Lippy said. Jake's mighty partial to Laurie. Hell, you're partial to her yourself, Gus said. We're all partial to her, but Jake ain't exactly a killer. He killed that man in Arkansas, Lorena said. Augustus shrugged. He fired off a buffalo gun, and the bullet happened to hit a dentist, he said. I don't call that no crime of passion. Lorena didn't like it that Gus acted like Jake wasn't much. He had a reputation for being a cool man in a fight. He killed that bandit, Lippy said. Hit him right in the Adam's apple, I've heard. The truth of that is the bandit rode into the bullet, Augustus said. He was unlucky, like the dentist. Lorena just sat. The situation was so unexpected that she could not think about it clearly. Of course, she had no intention of going upstairs with Gus, but he couldn't just be scared off with a look like some cowboy. Gus was not afraid of looks, or of Jake either, it seemed. I'll give you fifty dollars, Gus said with a big grin. Lippy nearly fell off his stool. 
He had never seen or imagined anything so rash. Fifty dollars for one poke? Then it occurred to him he would cheerfully give as much if he had it to get under Lorena's skirts. A man could always get more money, but there wasn't but one lorry, not on the border anyway. Hell, I would too, he said, just to register the offer. I didn't know you was so rich, Augustus said, a little amused. Well, I ain't now, but I might be, Lippy said. Business is picking up. Pshaw, Augustus said. Once we start the drive, you'll be lucky to earn a nickel in a month. Lorena decided her best out was to pretend to be frightened of Jake's vengeance, though now that she thought about it, she knew Gus was probably right. She had met one or two men who were proven killers, and Jake didn't have their manner at all. I won't do it, she said. He'll kill us if he finds out. How would he find out, Gus asked. Lippy might tell him, she said. Augustus looked at Lippy. It was true that the man was a dreadful gossip, and a gossip, moreover, who had scant materials to work with. It would not be easy for him to resist mentioning that he had heard a man offer fifty dollars for a poke. I'll give you ten dollars to keep your mouth shut, Augustus said, and if you betray me, I'll shoot another hole in your stomach. Give me the ten, Lippy said, his astonishment growing. That made sixty dollars Gus would be spending. He had never heard of anyone spending such an amount on their pleasure. But then, so far as he knew, there was no one anywhere like Gus, a man who seemed to care nothing for money. Gus handed over the money, and Lippy pocketed it, knowing he had struck a bargain he had better keep, at least until Gus died. Gus was no one to fool with. He had seen several men try, usually over card games, and most all of them had got whacked over the head with Gus's big gun. Gus didn't shoot unless he had to but he was not loath to whack a man. Lippy was dying to tell Xavier what he'd missed by going fishing, but he knew he had better postpone the pleasure for a few years. One hole in his stomach was enough. Lorena felt her indignation growing. She was beginning to feel cornered, something she had not expected to have to feel again. Jake was supposed to have ended that, and yet he hadn't. Of course he probably never suspected his own friend would make such a move behind his back, and yet it still seemed negligent of him, for he knew Gus's ways. You can pay him if you want to, but I ain't going, she said. Jake's my sweetheart. I ain't trying to cut him out, Augustus said. I just want a poke. 